Good afternoon from Tenderfoot Farms. It's March 17th and it's in the mid-afternoon. I thought I'd take you around and give you a tour of all the things that are beginning to grow on the farm. Hopefully you can see that. It's a bud on one of our Mars grapes. We have a row of Mars grapes here that we started a couple of years ago and I've got some more starts growing in a bucket so that we can finish out the row. I'll show you those here in just a minute. Over here, we've got our newest bed. This is a mix of raspberries and strawberries. We just planted these about three weeks ago. Got, uh, got these logs from our forest. I'm pretty excited about that. And the strawberries are not gonna be permanent in here. I'm gonna build a better raised bed for them. And that way I can add mulch to the raspberries without uh, burying the strawberries too much. But you can see that the bare root strawberries we ordered are just starting to grow right there. Right there we've got several different kinds of strawberries in here. So pretty excited about that. A little more on the farm tour. Here's uh, this is another row of trellis of grapes. These are Texas black Spanish grapes. They're a juice grape which I really enjoy. And we picked these uh, partly because it's a dark red uh, juice grape, but also because they are highly resistant to Pierce's disease, which tends to kill, kill a lot of uh, grape plants here in the south. And over here, next trellis over. Those are all really tiny. But this is a trellis I'm starting brand new this year of Concord seedless grapes. And then the one beyond that is the... This is a bunch of Loch Ness blackberries. These are baby plants that we self-rooted uh, from a trellis over by the dog run. But we're gonna do a whole 90 foot trellis. You can see we just planted these a week ago. And uh, so they're just barely starting to leaf out. You can see here we've got leaves growing on some of the vines and eventually we'll build a nice trellis for this just like we have all these others, but I'll do that later this summer. It's not necessary right now. You can see how nice and strong these trellises are. Those uh, nine gauge steel wires are under a lot of tension. It keeps them nice and strong. And to do that, you've got to have posts. These posts are sunk three feet deep and then they're well braced into each other so that you can crank down on those wires and get them really tight. I didn't mention it earlier, but this is back to the raspberry bed. You see these T posts at an angle. I'm gonna add some more and eventually they'll be angled like that on both sides, you know, coming up this direction on the left. And then out here, they'll have the nice big wooden posts like these. And we'll have some steel wires that go from the end posts on each end and then down on either side of these T posts. And uh, that way, your newest growth in the you know that's not going to fruit till the next year will come up in the center and then the one year old stuff you can bend over and tie it up to the wires that are on these diagonal posts there that lovely little field out there is our half acre garden right now it's got wheat in it the wheat is not really so we can harvest wheat but because i'll let it grow for a while and eventually i'll mow it and then disc it into the ground it helps keep it from being muddy in the winter time and provides some nitrogen in there when I disc it under. And then uh, this one, we're not really planting anything this year, except maybe some sunflowers, but we'll just keep growing good cover crops to help the dirt stay nice. This right here is our green walking onions. We're gonna add some Egyptian walking onions to this later. You see this lovely dark, dark black stuff that I've got around them. This is cotton mulch from the cotton gin. And uh, they just charge us $30 to load a 16 foot trailer as full as we can. And uh, so it, if you shovel it yourself, it's free. But uh, this stuff is, they're trash from when they gin the cotton. It's all the hulls and sticks and things like that. And it makes great mulch. You can see how healthy these onions look. They're really enjoying getting some nutrients from the mulch as it rains. 
but I'm gonna add some additional new kind of walking onion down here on the end. We'll mix in some cotton mulch into the ground and that'll be real nice this year. These are our current bushes. I first planted these early last year. They did terribly. And in fact, I had to buy some new ones. It says on the package or on everything I read on the web that they need full sun, but that's really full sun in Oregon, not Alabama. So here we've got them in partial shade. They're next to the pond. And this great big oak tree is gonna provide some lovely shade during the hottest part of the day. And uh, hopefully we'll start getting some currants on these, but they're just leafing out now, middle of March. And I'm looking forward to some currant bushes. We have two kinds here. There's a Prince Consort and a Minaj Smirnu, which are both black currants. And uh, I'm really excited about those. Here you can see one of our three hives. The bees are not gonna let me stay here very long. They're pretty, they're a little fussy today. Not very many flowers out that they can eat, but pretty soon we'll take off that entrance reducer as it gets just a little warmer. They're starting to tell me to go away and I'm not suited up for this, so I'm going to back up. We've got three hives, we'll probably expand to seven this year. Hopefully the wind's not too noisy, but continuing on with our farm tour, here's one of our blueberries. We planted some additional blueberry plants this winter. Um, these are some of the older ones. Here's some. We got nice flowers coming out pretty quick and uh, it's really blueberries are great all the adults here don't get very many blueberries because my son comes out early in the morning and eats them so we don't see very many of those so we're trying to plant enough plants that uh, we can stay ahead of him here's one of our new ones for this year I need to take this tag off like to emphasize with everybody I talk to is your local nurseries, especially the big box stores, but even the local nurseries do a terrible job at selecting plants that are the right thing for your environment. You've got to do a bunch of research. They give you apple trees that you're used to seeing, like Red Delicious, and Golden Delicious, and what they fail to tell you is that those things may be very prone to disease in your area. And uh, so it's maybe not the right thing unless you want to really maintain a long, you know, consistent spraying program. But if you do some research, you can get apple trees, and other fruit trees that are really much better suited for your area. You can see we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. We're trying to get to 16 blueberry plants. correctly otherwise this one would be a lot bigger but uh, this is the first year where it's going to get trained correctly muscadine grapes are pretty interesting because they need about 20 feet of row space per plant which is a lot these are uh, some seedless concords i've got here and i'll eventually move them or remove them but this year while this little muscadine and uh, Noble, I believe, Muscadines. So those are new, two of them are new, and then two of them, they're older, but they haven't been pruned correctly until this year. So they put out growth that mostly got pruned off because I let it go every which way. And then up here we've got Arapaho and Navajo blackberries. And uh, you can see that here in the middle of March. They're just leafing out in the last few days. Blackberries, these are the erect cane blackberries that hold themselves up. We tuck them into this wire fence just enough to be able to put next to them. But uh, when they get to be about four feet tall, you cut them off on the top and that 
forces them to put out branches down the sides and then they'll have a lot more berries on the branches and you don't have a plant that tries to go 12 feet up in the air but this way you get a lot more branching structure just by cutting it off as soon as you see a branch we cut these last year as soon as you see a branch get to about four four or five feet tall exactly how tall is up to you uh, it's not a magic number for the plant but by cutting it off that causes the plant to put out a bunch of branches and you get more berry surface to uh, grow your berries so this is about it's a 30 foot row maybe it's 40 feet you can see it starts down here and goes down that row is about three years old i believe this is one of our three pecan trees we had to replace one the one that was growing here died and uh, so we replaced it this year so this just got planted about a month ago uh, the very best time to plant your trees is in the middle of the winter when everything's nice and dormant this is a pecan tree that's uh, five years old so it's a little taller than me and uh, starting to branch out nicely and each year I prune it just a little bit to help it not have branches rub on itself and uh, just kind of maintain a pretty good structure so that's a four-year-old pecan this one over here is its buddy also a four-year-old pecan and uh, so we'll have three pecan trees It'll be another couple of years before they start to put out nuts, but pretty nice. We've got good space. I had to think about where to put these because I've got good space between them and that garden right there. This is a different one than the garden I showed you earlier. This one's a quarter acre, not a half. And again, it's got wheat growing in it over the winter. Wheat is really cheap to buy, buy the 50 pound bag to seed it. And uh, I don't have a seeder for my tractor, so this is just broadcast with a big, you know, push push uh, broadcast seeder. And then I used some discs to just disc it into the ground. And then I hand mixed in some uh, other cover crop seeds. So you can see right here, that's a winter pea that's mixed in. And there's also some, this is a radish. It's a tillage radish, a uh, daikon radish, they go really deep. And so there's radishes out there that are going to seed and I'll collect the seeds off the radishes uh, if I have enough time. This garden's actually gonna get used this year. This is where we'll plant all of our main vegetable crops. And over the winter, we've only had one thing growing here. You can see our garlic. And I just came out and flame weeded which is why all these are dead. But I haven't weeded in between the garlic plants. When we flame weeded, my son and I did it, and I held up a big piece of sheet steel right next to the garlic plants, and then he used the flame, the weed burner. Uh, but that helped us not burn the garlic. You're really supposed to use flame weeders more on very tiny weeds. I was trying to get enough of a break that I could get ahead and have a chance to weed what was left here before it got too too bad and so the flame weeder just helped me stunt everything that's on either side of the raised row here i'll come through and weed by hand in the middle of the plants this is one of our hazelnut trees or hazelnut bushes you can prune them to be a tree or a bush and i'm mostly letting this one keep be kind of bush like it keeps the nuts a little closer to the ground make it easier to harvest them by hand. These are two years old now and I think they'll start producing nuts next year. Um, I bought these from Burnt Ridge Nursery which is a really nice nursery to get things from. You can see I've got one variety over there across the ditch and here and then one up here. When you're planting hazelnuts you've got to look at which things are uh, in bloom at the same time so that you can make sure they get some cross-pollination you get better nuts that way and uh, you can see these are budding out for spring I'm really excited about hazelnuts uh, when you buy them you really ought to get them from a good nursery that knows what they're talking about uh, you can also buy hazelnuts that are just native from somewhere like tractor supply 
But then you get something like this, which is only about a foot tall. And it was planted at the same time as those great big ones. And it's a native bush. And I will probably end up replacing it with a proper variety, but uh, good hazelnut trees like uh, Yam Hill or, or uh, Jefferson or something like that, they're not cheap. I think they're 25 or $28 at the piece, but they're very resistant to blight and they grow much better. And so I highly recommend that. I was telling you earlier about how important it is to find good varieties of apples and other fruit trees that grow well in your area. This one I just planted this winter. This is a Liberty apple, and it's one of those that's immune or highly resistant to lots of different things, diseases that are common here. We have a particular problem with fire blight here. This is a all-in-one almond tree that's quite young, and uh, I know it looks a little bit severely pruned, but I'm encouraging it to put out the branch structure that I want. And then down the way, there's a Hall's Hardy Almond, and then the tree beyond that is a Asian Persimmon. That one was planted two years ago, this Asian Persimmon here. And then its neighbor, over here, another Asian persimmon uh, was planted the year before. This one I'm particularly proud of because when we got this tree, the trunk of it was quite warped. You can still see that it's fairly bent like this, but it used to be much more severe and I've been training it by choosing which branches to prune to help it straighten up. You can do that by encouraging it. We've got a Bartlett pear tree here that's going crazy. It's got beautiful flowers on it. Pear trees have a very strong desire to grow straight up with horrible crotch angles here in their, in their branches, which makes them weak. And so this one has been a challenge to try and prune it, to convince it to grow better branch angles and to spread out instead of growing quite so tall. I cut more than four feet off the top of it this year. This is another pear tree. I forget which variety it is. Uh, either this one's the Turnbull or that one up there is the Turnbull, one or the other. I just don't remember at the moment. And then next to it, that up there is an Empire or Enterprise. I believe that's an Enterprise apple tree. That's my best apple tree. The white paint that you see there is for protecting against sunburn. And over there in the corner, there's a crab apple tree, and it's a pollinator for all these other trees because it stays in bloom for a long time. Um, we've got this is a Roxbury russet apple tree, and then over there is an Arkansas black. This little one close to the dog run is a King David. This one down here is a William's favorite, and it got damaged in its younger life. I don't know if it was sunburn or some kind of rot, but you can see this whole core piece right here is dead. But this out here, you know, more, more than half the tree is still alive, and it's doing a pretty good job at keeping the tree alive. So I may have to replace this tree, but I'm letting it, letting it keep trying. And this little tree here is a Williams Pride tree. Each of these was selected for being resistant or immune to the diseases that are most common in my area. And then I have four peach trees, different kinds. I do not claim to be any good at peaches yet. I've had trouble finding peach trees that grow well here. And down here we've got chickens and ducks. This is the chicken coop. I like this chicken coop. I think it turned out really well. It's one that I built. The One of the best features about it is the subfloor in this chicken coop. Chicken coop floors have a bad tendency to rot over time because of water. And this one, this material right here is what they make subfloors of houses out of and it's rated for 90 days of contact with water. 
and so far it's holding up really well. This is its fifth year. Looks like we need to come in and collect some eggs, but you can see this is tall enough I can stand up in here. Um, this is a little add-on that we put so we had room for more birds to nest. And then this is to keep the chickens out up here because they kept going up there and we were getting so much poop collecting up there that it was really tough to um, really tough to keep it clean. So we put some screening up there. We also put screening up here because they really like getting up in there to roost. And then I've got one clear panel on the roof that just lets some sunlight in here so that it's easy to see. I gotta tell the kids to bring some chicken food out. Looks like they're out. Say hi, chicken. You got chickens everywhere. Most of these are black Osterlorps, which we like because they forage really well. And then we've got Rhode Island Reds and a couple of random chickens. That one out there is a meat, meat bird of some sort. I don't remember which kind. You can see this grid we've got here with ribbons. It's a combination of steel wire and lots of fishing line. And that causes the hawks. You can see it fluttering in the breeze out there. The grid's only about every two or three feet, but it's enough that way up high, the hawks see that as a surface. And so they don't swoop down to kill the birds. And then we've got these big willow trees in here that provide cover for them to hide from the, from the uh, hawks and so forth. Here's the ducks. They're all running away. They're not too excited about having their picture taken. Mostly they just don't like people too much because I'm not the one who feeds them. But uh, we like the ducks. Sarah's allergic to chicken eggs now and, and uh, she's not allergic to duck eggs. So she really enjoys having those. You can see the duck pens I've got here. They're all triangular shaped. And right now you can tell that there's kind of this big flap on the front of them that's closed. And that's because we had some strong wind here recently. But that front flap is hinged and it'll pick up and I can just prop some sticks underneath it that keep it open and then the ducks go inside. But they can get under even when we close the hinge. They just scoot underneath that front edge and uh, that helps them have a place to hide out of strong rain and strong wind. Hey ducks. Here's my biggest, oldest peach tree. As I remember right, this is a Bell of Georgia. You can see it's quite well bloomed out and quite pretty. It's going to get down to 30 degrees tonight. I need to go refresh my brain on exactly what temperature causes them problems. I think it's 27. Um, we're in the very northern edge of Alabama and peaches have a bad tendency to get fooled into thinking it's time to bloom out and it's really just a little bit too early for them. So we frequently lose our peaches because they'll bloom and then they get killed by the frost. We may come spread a sheet over the top of this to uh, help it resist some frost if we think there's going to be a problem. And here's another peach tree. This one's a different variety. I don't remember which kind. And you can tell it's pretty severely pruned, but you want to you cut the center of the peach tree off and then you get you force it to grow three or four main structure branches so that it becomes an open vase shape. It's very humid and we get lots of rain here, and so we've got to make sure they get plenty of airflow to keep their diseases down. Well, that's kind of the farm tour for this early in the spring. I'll try to do one every couple of weeks, keep you guys aware of what's going on and how things are turning out. Uh, I'll show you some of the stuff I've got planted as sprouts here in a minute. Right, hang on just a second. In addition to paying attention to what day it is on the calendar, I also track the soil temperature. It's measuring the soil temperature three inches down and uh, check it every morning and keep track of that because that has to do with the germination temperature for all the seeds you plant and it helps you stay ahead of things like late springs and 
uh, winter that gets crazy and doesn't know how to go away and so forth so I checked this and so even though it's 60 degrees and sunny and green today our soil temperature in the morning is still hovering between 45 and 53 most days and that's just not warm enough for most things except for potatoes it is time to plant potatoes way back near the end of October we planted kale I guess I should have told you earlier we're in zone 7a or 7b depending on which map you look at we planted lots of kale about a hundred foot row of it we feed it to the pigs we eat it ourselves we do all sorts of stuff with kale this is a Scottish curly leaf kale it's just what I can get cheapest for seed down at my local seed store uh, at the county co-op or or the feed mill and uh, this stuff is great. It's actually quite healthy right now. During the winter time, it grows right through even when it gets really cold. And you can see that sometimes if it gets down around 15 degrees or so, it'll kill some of the leaves off, but it comes right back when it gets a little bit warmer. So we can have fresh kale all winter long. We also grew, these look a little sad now, but we grew turnips that we had all winter. And bunch of daikon radishes and they look awful now but that's okay because I'm letting them go to seed these are turnips so I'm gonna collect seeds from my turnips this year you can see they're they're starting to go to seed right there and then down here these are the daikon radishes some of them have died completely they're humongous and, uh, but some of them are going to seed. Daikon radish seed for some reason is very expensive. So I'm excited about collecting some seed from that this year. And then last but not least here, mixed in with my winter weeds, this is curly leaf mustard, which we planted last year and we only got one plant that grew. We planted it in October and I guess it was just a little bit too cold. But uh, this year, in the early early spring february and march it started to grow again mostly february and that's the first year i've ever tried to grow mustard my plan was to grow a big row of it and make my own mustard from the seeds but uh, instead we'll just eat it for greens and learn about when to plant it the right time these are the rest of the seeds that are growing for this year We've got thyme and basil and oregano all kinds of red and purple and pink tomatoes lots of different peppers i'll do a video about what kinds later but it's a little early most of them haven't sprouted yet a few of them have we've also over here got ginger plants and our sweet potato starts are getting going they're just starting to vine out and some angel trumpet flowers that my wife has grown so lots of different stuff this bucket doesn't look all that exciting, but I'm excited about it. In that bucket is turmeric and sunchokes. It's our first year to try those and I just put them in there after we got them from the store. So it's out getting warm so that it'll start to sprout. I'll have to bring it inside though, because it's still freezing. Here I've got two buckets of cuttings that I made from seedless concords. You can see that they're starting to get buds on them and then up up here well, another one of these is mars grapes and the texas black spanish so these are enough for us to fill out our remaining trellises and maybe give some away and then in here i've got some baby oak trees growing from acorns from acorns from a tree that we already grew from an acorn tree so these will be grandkid trees or maybe they're kid trees. How are you gonna look at that? Our second generation of oak tree. Well, that's it. Hope you enjoy a little bit about our tour of Tenderfoot Farms. Looks like I've got chickens out in the grape trellises. They like to move my cotton mulch from where I wanted it to where they think it should go because there's all sorts of little bugs in there and they love hunting for those bugs. That's all for now, we'll talk to you later. Please subscribe and hope you enjoy the video.